All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. To Martha he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Before we open God's word today, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that it is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Thank you for what it reveals to us about our salvation. That we must realize that the more we study it, the more we think about it, meditate on it, the more we probe its depths, not just in terms of what happened historically, but in terms of its significance to every human being, its significance in its impact in the universe, and its significance especially in individual lives who are transformed by faith alone in Christ's death on the cross alone. Father, we pray that as we study today, we might come to a greater understanding of, what, of, of that transaction that occurred on the cross as our sins were paid for, as redemption was accomplished, and the debt against us was canceled. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> Open your Bibles with me to, initially, we're going to look at John 19, but we will also come back to Matthew chapter 27. As we continue our study in Matthew, we're in the section related to the crucifixion of Christ. Several lessons back, I began to break this down into the various stages, the various events that occurred once the guilty verdict was uh, pronounced and they led Jesus out from the praetorium where he was tried by Pontius Pilate the third of the second, <coughs> second pon trial under Pilate, the third of the civil trials, that at that point they led him out to be crucified. And so we began to work our way through what is said in the Synoptic Gospels and the Gospel of John to further understand the order of events and what is taking place. Today we come to the second three hours on the cross. We have looked at the first three hours where the wrath of man was spit out, was thrown at the Lord through the reviling, the blasphemy, other things that happened during those first three hours, but it came from man. It didn't come from God. Then we come to the time from 12 noon to 3 p.m. when darkness covers the face of the earth. And this is when that divine transaction takes place, the payment for our sin. And so this begins with what is the 17th stage. Actually, we have one more thing in the previous section before we get into it, so we'll start with number 17. We looked at the first five stages, which involved the procession to Golgotha from the Praetorium to Golgotha. Then we came to the first three hours, the wrath of men. One change from what I said last week. We talked about the <clears throat> four mockings of Jesus on the cross, and that should be changed to five. What I discover here, even though the word mocking isn't used in this section, there is mocking that takes place, okay? So even though the word isn't used, it's definitely happening. So we're going to go to eight mockings of Jesus, five mockings on the cross. So we'll look first at uh, the last thing that happens before darkness comes, and that is revealed in John 19, 25 to 27. And this is the third statement that Jesus makes from the cross, John 19, 25 to 27. 
And there we read, <clears throat> Now there stood by, there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister, and Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. So this tells us in this passage that there are four women, and according to John, they are by the cross. Now, I point that out because in the synoptics, it says they were at a distance. I think that there's no contradiction here, but they moved there away from their nearness to the cross for whatever reason they moved. And so uh, the accuracy of, of the other gospel writers must not be doubted. Uh, they carefully looked, especially Luke. He's a careful historian. He uh, carefully uh, researched what happened. And so we can trust that there's no contradiction here. They were near, and then they moved away at some distance. There are four women that are mentioned here. There is Mary, his mother. There is the mention of the sister of Mary in John 19.25, his mother's sister. We will see that she should be identified as Salome, who is the mother of the sons of Zebedee. James and John. Then third, we see that there is another Mary who is the wife of Clopas in John, and he's, her name is written as Cleopas in Luke 24, 18. And she's also identified as the mother of James the Less and, or, and Joseph or Joseph. So these are two other disciples. And then Mary Magdalene. So let's look at these. Mary, his mother, is standing by the cross. These four women, it's interesting, these four women at the foot of the cross are witnesses to not only his crucifixion, but they are witnesses to his burial and they are witnesses to his resurrection. They are introduced here as the four women there at the cross. And it's interesting because in that culture at that time that the most un, they thought that the most unreliable of witnesses were women. You just couldn't trust what they said. Those women are flighty and they're hysterical and you just can't pay attention to it. So that's not a trustworthy thing to rely on a woman. But that just validates what the scriptures are teaching. Because if you were going to write a fraudulent account, if you were going to make up a story out of whole cloth, then you would choose the most respected people to be your witnesses of what happened. You would write a story about, about Jesus and have women as the witnesses because they're not reliable. That attests to the veracity of Scripture. Because this is what happened. The witnesses were women and they're reliable. So if a, if a fraud were writing this, that's the last thing they would do is identify women as the key witnesses of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord. The first woman mentioned is his mother Mary. And this is a reminder of the prophecy of Simeon. In Luke 2, you remember Simeon, there were two. There was Simeon and Hannah. Simeon and Hannah are both very old, very ancient, and they have been given revelation from God uh, that they will witness the Messiah. And so when Mary and Joseph bring Jesus to the temple for his dedication, as they enter Simeon comes over. The Holy Spirit somehow informs him that this is the Messiah. And he came over, and we have three or four verses of his uh, blessing upon Mary, Joseph, and his statements about the Lord. And in that, he says to Mary, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel. The fall meaning that they would not believe him. They would reject him and they would reject his offer of the kingdom. The rising, of course, refers to those who would respond and would be saved. 
and <clears throat> for a sign which will be spoken against. They will speak against him. This is what has led to the crucifixion. And then he says to her personally, he says, yes, a sword will per pierce through your own soul also. And here she stands, the mother of the humanity of our Lord, looking at the cross, looking at her firstborn, who is, has been tortured, has been beaten, and is being crucified. And, and we can't even imagine the thoughts that were going through her head. How much she comprehended about who he was and his mission is seen in her response when Gabriel first announces that she is going to be pregnant and give birth to the Messiah. But then later, just like others at that time, she's not real sure who he is. And we can't grasp this level of certainty and then confusion unless we look at our own lives and we know that there are times when we're absolutely certain of the truth of Scripture and other times when we're, we're, we're not so sure. That's part of humanity. Remember, these folks are not indwelt by the Holy Spirit. They don't have the filling of the Spirit like we do. So there's definitely a difference in their life. So she is standing there witnessing the crucifixion of her firstborn. Then we know she has a family member there. It's identified by John as his mother's sister. So she's not alone. Uh, she, we don't know how old she is at this time, but if our Lord is approximately 30 to 35 years of age, then she's probably in her late 40s to early 50s probably right around 50. His father, Joseph, has died by this time, by the time he, he entered into his public ministry. So Salome is her sister. She's identified in the Mark passage I have up here that when he lists the women at the cross, and notice he says they were also women looking on from afar. This is later in the uh, in, into the three-hour block of darkness. So they had moved away from being right by the cross. They're listed as Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, um, the less, and Joseph, and Joseph, and Salome. So she's named there. Matthew 27, 56 says, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. So you have Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James the Less and Joseph. They're mentioned in all three passages. Mary, the mother of Jesus, is obviously distinct. She's mentioned in John 19, but there's one who is identified three different ways. Salome, the mother of the sons of Zebedee, and his mother's sister. So she is it also tells us that James and John are first cousins to Jesus. This is a family affair. The third person is Mary, the wife of Clopas, as he's identified in John, but he's identified in Luke 24, 18 as Cleopas. This is the first one. He is, um, uh, and she's also identified as the mother of James, the less, and of Joseph. So, so she's the mother of two disciples. Cleopas is identified as a disciple in Luke 24, 13, not one of the 12. Uh, Luke 24, 13, after the resurrection, behold, two of them, the them refers to his disciples, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And on the way, the Lord, somewhat having his identity cloaked, appears to them and begins to talk to them. And then we're told, then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him. Okay. Now, we don't know much about him. That's the only time he's, the only two times he's mentioned in Scripture. However, it's interesting. We can't say for sure, but early church tradition, early, early church, church tradition, going back into the uh, second century, tells us that he was the brother of Joseph. I don't know that that's true. I don't know that it's not true. But it might have been true. If it's true, then you have first cousins among the disciples on his mother's side, uh, first cousins on his adopted father's side. John the Baptist was also a cousin. So this is a family affair. Very, they're very close. 
I've always found that to be quite interesting. And then there is Mary Magdalene. There's a lot of confusion about Mary Magdalene. There are people from the Gnostic side who think that somehow she married Jesus and all sorts of nonsense about her. But her second name, Magdalene, means that she is from the village of Magdala, which is on the Sea of Galilee's western shore. When I was in Israel the last time, about two years ago, I got an opportunity to go to this archaeological site now that has just been excavated over the last four or five years and some of the findings that are there, the synagogue that was there, some of the other things, the altar of the synagogue has been found, so it's quite fascinating. And we'll be going there for the first time on my uh, this coming Israel trip in June. What we know of her is that Jesus had cast uh, demons out of her, as described in Luke 8, 2. Often she is identified, I think very wrongly, as the sinful woman mentioned in Luke 7, 36 to 50. Uh, ha that has nothing to do with Mary Magdalene. We do not know really that much about her other than she is there at the cross, the burial, and the, the resurrection. And then and it, John goes on to tell us that with these four women standing there, that Jesus then begins to speak and ad address Mary, his mother, and the apostle John, who is standing there as well. Now, as we look at this, this is his third statement from the cross. His previous two statements have been very gracious and related to salvation. He said when he's first hung on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Then he says, just prior to this, where we ended last time, the second thief on the cross who said, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. Jesus said, I will be with you today in paradise, indicating the salvation of that second thief. Now, here is a man who has gone through unbelievable beatings and torture and flogging. He has been reviled and ridiculed and blasphemed. He's been beaten, all kinds of things. His third statement is just as gracious as the other two, but it's not related to salvation. He is fulfilling his responsibility as a firstborn son. It is his responsibility to see that his mother is taken care of. His father is no longer there, and so he is going to entrust the care of his mother to the disciple whom he loved. We read in verse 26, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. He's indicating that now John will be, um, be his son. And then we're told in verse 27, he says to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. Now, we know from the end of the Gospel of John that this disciple whom Jesus loved is the one who wrote this Gospel. He's often referred to as the Gospel uh, whom Jesus loved, and so that identifies John and a close relationship with John. John is the youngest of the disciples, so he's the one who's most likely to live long enough to take care of Mary. Also, we know that there's a hint in the prophecy uh, that, John, that is stated in John 21 that John will not die as a martyr as the other, other disciples. And so Jesus is going to entrust her care to a, a disciple who is going to grow and mature, but not to one of his natural half-brothers because they're not believers yet. They are all unbelievers. So he's going to entrust the care of his mother to someone outside the family who is actually a nephew, who is a believer, who will take care and shows uh, care, wisdom, graciousness, and responsibility on the part of a son for his mother. That ends the first three hours on the cross. Then we come to the second three hours on the cross which is focusing on the payment for sin. This takes place between 12 noon and 6 p.m. 
And these are stages 18 down through uh, 22, 23 rather. These describe the events related to the spiritual death of Christ on the cross, not his physical death. We will come back next time and look at the events that occurred at the time he died physically and the significance of the death of Christ in its entirety on the cross. That will be next time. So the Gospels, the Synoptics, are united in their statement about the covering of darkness. That it is from the sixth hour which is noon on our time, and the ninth hour. There's darkness all over the land. Mark 15, 33 says uh, darkness over the whole land, and Luke 23, 44 says over all the earth. You notice anything there? Is it land or earth? In Greek, it's the same word in all three verses. My question is, is this talking about the whole earth being covered in darkness, or is this just talking about the land of Israel, basically the eastern part of the Mediterranean? Is that it? And I believe it is localized. I don't believe it was all of the earth. Nevertheless, as we uh, study what has been unearthed by a variety of, of apologists, that there were those outside of Israel in the eastern part of the Mediterranean that do make comments about a, an unusual darkness that covered that end of the Mediterranean. Whether they're talking about the same event, I do have questions. There's Dionysius, who's a Greek scientist who lived in Egypt, not that far away, who reported a, experiencing this darkness while he was in the city of Heliopolis. And there's also a second writer, Diogenes, who was also a Greek scientist living in Egypt and uh, <clears throat> commented on the same darkness. About it he wrote, either the deity himself suffers at this moment or sympathizes with one that does. Of course, he had no knowledge of who Jesus was or anything else. He just was commenting on the severity of this darkness. Others have tried to identify this as a solar eclipse. In fact, there is a uh, comment made by Phlegon, who was a, uh, an Egyptian as well, who makes a comment about this, identifying it as an eclipse. This was picked up by Origen later on, and Origen used that to substantiate as an external witness what had transpired at the cross. I mentioned this in a lesson in First Peter when we were going through uh, apologetics, but as I was studying for this lesson, I ran across a quotation from Alfred Adersheim, who wrote a huge volume on the life and times of Jesus the Messiah, and he raises some doubt about Phlegon's uh, comment. I, <clears throat> once I read that, because in origin he doesn't identify the year or some other things, but Adersheim does, says he identifies as the year 29, which is four years off. Also says that Phlegon identifies this as having occurred in the fall in November, which is the wrong time of year. So that is not a valid source to go to. Furthermore, he identifies it as a solar eclipse. And I pointed this out before. It can't be a solar eclipse because it's Passover. Passover is always on a full moon. You can't have a solar eclipse when you have a full moon. Okay, because the moon is on the other side of the earth. To have an eclipse, the moon has to be between the earth and the sun. So for those reasons, that's not a, I don't think that's a v valid uh, reference. But it raises some questions about the others because they don't give enough detail in terms of year or other circumstances to be able to truly substantiate that that is the exact time of when, of when, they, are, of when they are speaking. However, there is another statement, another statement that is made by Thallus in AD 52. So this is some 19 years after the cross. 
and he wrote a history of the Eastern Mediterranean civilization from the Trojan War to his own time, and he cites another work by uh, uh, Julius Africanus, and who asserted that the whole, on the whole world there pressed a most fearful darkness, and the rocks were rent by an earthquake, and many places in Judea and other districts were thrown down. And this darkness, Thales, in his third book of his history, calls an event that was without reason and not necessarily an eclipse of the sun. They didn't know what it was. So that may be a valid, uh, a valid witness outside of the Bible for this darkness. But what is more important as we look at this is why the darkness covered the face of the earth. Is this the face of, the, of just Israel or is it the face of the world? I think it is just the face of Israel because the, we must understand the purpose for it. There are, in fact, I, I looked at one commentary, well-known, well-respected author, listed six different reasons that people have put forth for why the darkness covered the earth. And he didn't list the correct reason. I thought, I can't believe he missed that because it's a popular view, I mean, and he just left it out. So, why did God cover the land in darkness? It's a time of judgment. Darkness is frequently associated with judgment in the scripture. In Isaiah 5.20, Isaiah 60.20, in Joel 2.10, in Joel uh, 2.30 and 31, and Amos 9, the last three references all relate to darkness at the time of the day of the Lord, at the end of the tribulation. The first two reference tribulation, you can, I could have listed five pages of references to substantiate this. Darkness indicates judgment. And there is a judgment that is taking place on the cross. This is point number two. During this time, Jesus is judged. He is judicially separated from the Father. Uh, for the fa and the Father in, uh, imputes our sins to Christ on the cross. Now, some people then say, well, how does this happen? It's got to be judicial. Because in the Trinity... Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they are eternally united forever. You can't separate ontologically in terms of their very being. You can't come in and separate any member of the Trinity from the whole because of their eternal union. What we have here is a judicial separation. Now, let's develop this a little more. Under point three, this is during the time that Jesus takes the baptism of the cup. He had uh, prophesied that, that he would, uh, or when he talks to James and John, when uh, Mama Salome wants to get them elevated to sit on his right and left hand in the kingdom, he says, Are they, can they drink the cup that I will drink? This is the cup that he is drinking. It's the, called the baptism of the cup because he's being identified with the cup, and often God's judgment in the Old Test Testament is portrayed as God pouring out judgment from a cup. So that's the imagery that's there. And he's being identified with the wrath of God, not in his deity, but in his humanity. Now, we have to be careful when we say that because too many times it's been poorly articulated. Remember, in the definition of the hypostatic union, that is the union of humanity and deity together in one person, the thirsting of Christ, as we'll see in a minute, is evidence of his humanity. He thirsted. Deity doesn't thirst. But the person, the united person, thirsts. Because it's one person there on the cross. You can't come in and split him in two, which was... Uh, the error of some of the early church fathers as they were trying to figure out how the humanity and the deity of Christ related together. The person of Christ, that one person on the cross, his deity and humanity united together in one person suffers. But it is, hum and it, it is his humanity that is receiving the judgment of sin. 
because God doesn't substitute for human beings. But humanity does. It is the humanity of our Lord that is our substitute in salvation, not deity. Deity doesn't pay for our sins. Humanity pays for sins. Like must substitute for like. So it's during this time that he is identified with uh, our sins and receives the judgment of God. This is what 2 Corinthians 5.21 talks about, that he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So under point four, it is his humanity, not his deity, that receives that imputation of sin. It is a judicial act and a judicial separation from God. And separation from God is how we define what concept? Spiritual death. This is, it's not the physical death of Jesus on the cross. It is his spiritual death when he is separated from the Father judicially because he becomes sin judicially in our place and for us. That is the transaction on the cross. And this is completed, as we'll see, before he dies physically. In fact, there are some other things that happen here that are quite interesting. Just little hints of that must be explained in terms and are understood in terms of what I'm, I'm teaching here. So it's point five, what I've just said, the separation from the Father is spiritual death. So Jesus is paying the penalty for sin, our spiritual death, before he dies physically. That takes us all the way back to what I've taught many, many times in Genesis chapter, chapter two, that the legal penalty, Jesus, uh, the Father said you can eat from any fruit, any tree in the garden, accept the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and if you eat from that, you will die. That wasn't physical death, that's spiritual death. That's what happened immediately when God came to walk in the garden after they ate of the fruit, they ran and hid. They are separated from the Father. What God outlines in Genesis chapter 3 with regard to the hostility between the woman and the serpent, the uh, serpent crawling uh, on the ground, the um, power struggle between the wife and the husband, the fact that thorns and thistles will come forth from the earth and man will earn his living now by the sweat of his brow. The last thing that is stated, those are all consequences of spiritual death. The last thing that is stated is from uh, the dust you came to dust you will return. That's physical death. Physical death is the last, it's the greatest, it's the most significant of the consequences of spiritual death. But those are consequences, not the penalty. The penalty is separation from God. And so that's what I say when we go through the Lord's table every time, is that the blood, the, the cup is a picture of shed blood, which is a picture of death, but not physical death, but spiritual death. The penalty, when the time when he pays the penalty for sin on the cross. This is seen even more in the next statement, which is stage 19, the fourth statement from the cross. There in Matthew 27, 46, we read, and about the ninth hour, so three hours has gone by, and we're not told of anything that happens in those three hours other than there is darkness. And near the end of that three-hour period, Jesus cries out with a loud voice. He screams out, and he says in Aramaic, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is uh, <clears throat> taken from Psalm 22.1. It's the first line of that psalm. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? Now, at this time in the history of the Bible, there's no chapter divisions. There's no verse divisions. You, if you talk to a Jew at that time about the 22nd Psalm, he wouldn't know what you were talking about. You would refer to him, refer to that Psalm as Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani. That's the title of the Psalm. It's just like the title of Genesis in the Hebrew Bible is Bereshit. Uh, 
That's the very first word in Genesis 1.1, Bereshit bara Elohim, in the beginning God created. So the title of the book was In the Beginning. Now, if Jesus is said to have said Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, it's very likely he didn't just quote that. He is, what the writer is saying is he quoted that psalm. He recites the entire Psalm 22 with all of its messianic prophecies. It's the second most important messianic prophecy in the Old Testament, next, second only to Isaiah uh, chapter 53. The words there in both Greek and Hebrew indicate something, leaving something behind, deserting something, forsaking. It can have a, <clears throat> it can have the context of just everyday events. Somebody leave somebody, abandon something, or can have a judicial connotation of, <clears throat> of being uh, forsaken legally. Uh, could be used in the case of a divorce or desertion or abandonment. And so that is what <clears throat> what is used here. Again, it emphasizes that there is a judicial separation that takes place between the father and the son. The other thing that we should note here, because for many years, a number of pastors have mistakenly stated this, that when Jesus said, my God, my God, my God the first time is the Father, and my God the second time is the Spirit. And so he is being abandoned by the other two members of the Trinity. You may have heard that. However, when you go on to read it, and it says, why have you forsaken me, the you is not a second personal plural. It's not, he's not saying, my God, my God, why have y'all forsaken me? He's saying, my God, my God, why have you singular forsaken me? He's talking to God the Father because God the Father is the judge. He's not talking about God the Holy Spirit because God the Holy Spirit is sustaining him throughout this time on the cross. So this is important to make those distinctions and to correct maybe some misunderstanding. Then we come to the 20th stage, the reaction of the bystanders, and this is really the eighth mocking that takes place. Look at what happens. Some of those who stood there, when they heard him say, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, they said, he's calling for Elijah. They didn't think of, here, Eli is calling my God, but he's calling for Elijah. And immediately one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine or vinegar, put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. And the rest, the others said, leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah will come and save him. See, that's the mocking. Well, you know, he thinks Elijah's going to save him. He's calling on Elijah. Just wait. Let's, don't give him anything to drink. So that's the eighth mocking. Now, what's interesting here is why, why would they mistake Eli for Eliyahu? Uh, as maybe they think it's a shortened form of Elijah. And that is because in pop Judaism, Judaism on the street it was just as misinformed, ill-informed, and confused as pop Christianity that flows through the pews of most churches in America. Nobody takes enough time to really read what the text says. And they didn't read what the text says. They just had this, this common view that Elijah is going to be coming back uh, before the Messiah comes and before the end, that it has something to do with, uh, you know, pop eschatology. And so that's what they're thinking. He's calling upon Elijah. Elijah will show up, and this will bring the end of the world, and he'll get rescued from the cross. That's how they've misunderstood this within their uh, popular misinformed eschatology. And we've seen a couple of passages back earlier in Matthew 17, 9 to 13, where they also demonstrate there the same kind of uh, misunderstanding and misidentification of, uh, of Elijah uh, when it was related to John the Baptist. So this is their reaction. So they're just mocking Jesus. It's, it's not too different from what was said earlier. Uh, he saved others, now let him save himself. They just keep running that same, uh, same basic theme. Then we come to the 21st stage. This is the fifth statement from the cross. In John 19, 28, we read, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. 
something interesting happens here. The three hours are up. Jesus has paid the penalty for sin. How do we know that? We'll come back to this in the next statement. But he's, that John says, knowing that all things were now accomplished. In the Greek, this is the word tetelestai, which means it's finished, it's complete. This is the same word Jesus uses a couple of verses later when he says, it is finished. So John uses that word twice so that you get the point that by this point, everything had transpired to complete the transaction of payment for sin. Something else has taken place here. When we go back to the quote from Psalm 22, Jesus calls upon God and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now the interesting thing is throughout Jesus' ministry, he referred to God as his father. He referred to God as his father over 150 times and of those 150 times, there were at least 45 times. The reason I say about is because the computer programs differ. I don't know, the search is a little different. What some people have written is a little different, so I'm going to generalize it. Of the total, it's 150 to maybe 170 times. And of those 45 to 50 times, it's my father. Jesus has that personal relationship with God the father. But here... This is the only time he refers to him as my God, showing that that fellowship, that intimacy is broken because of spiritual death. That's changed now. It's going to change now, as we'll see. Uh, now that it's over with, John makes a statement, it's been completed, and now Jesus speaks again. Up to this point, uh, from the time that he talked about Mary to John, he hasn't um, said anything. Now he's saying, uh, I thirst. He cried out to God in the fourth statement, and now in the fifth statement, he's going to talk. And he says, I thirst. This indicates the true humanity of Jesus. It also indicates that he is physically on the cross. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, the heresy developed by the early second century called docetism. And it's from the Greek word dokeo, which means to appear. And they said, no, Jesus wasn't really physically, it was a Gnostic, form of a Gnostic heresy. He wasn't physically dying because he couldn't physically die. So it just appeared that he did. No, this shows us that, that the true humanity of Jesus is on the cross and he thirsted. So it's, it gives us a, another example that Scripture recognizes that humanity of, cross is, of Jesus is on the cross. And then they give him vinegar. Matthew 27, 48 says, Immediately one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine. And the word there is really vinegar. This was not the same as the, what was offered to him at the beginning with the mixture of myrrh or gall. That was used as an, as an anesthetic to dull the pain. This is not the same. This was typically a drink that Roman soldiers would have in order to quench their thirst. And so this is what is given to Jesus. It's offered for him to drink. And, and he does. That's why there's this vessel. John 19, 29 says there's a vessel full of this sour wine or vinegar sitting there. They uh, fill the sponge with sour wine, put it on his, put it to his mouth. And then we come to the sixth statement. This is where we'll end this morning in John 19, 30. See, we saw this same word, I have it on the slide there in two verses earlier in John 19, 28. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he drank it. Why did he drink it? After all of this, his mouth is probably parched. He's thirsty. He, he, he is getting ready to make one of the most significant statements of all history. He has something to wet his whistle, as it were, to uh, get rid of the dry mouth, and he can yell out, to tell us die. It's accomplished. 
It's paid in full. We have discovered through archaeological remains of documents that on receipts, when someone paid the bill, what they would stamp on it was to tell us die. Paid in full. It's done. He's still alive physically. It was accomplished. To is a perfect tense verb. And that means it has already been accomplished. When he says it, it's completed. So it's not it is being accomplished or it is being finished. Any kind of continuative idea is no longer present. It has already been completed with results that will go on forever. And so twice the Apostle John uses this word so we get the point that the death of Christ isn't something that it goes on and on and on. Totally negates the whole idea in a Roman Catholic Mass where Jesus is re-crucified each time the Mass takes place. No, it is completed, it's finished, it's done. Nothing can be added to it. Nothing helps. You, that's why the gospel is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ alone. It's not believe and do something better. You can't help it. You can't add something. In fact, if you add something to the gospel, you destroy the gospel. There's no salvation in faith plus. Anything you add to faith destroys faith because then you're relying on something other than Christ alone for salvation and his sufficient work on the cross. That's what sufficient means. It was enough because it was paid in full. And what we learn from Colossians chapter 2, 12 through 14, is that when that happens, the financial transaction is the canceling of a debt against us so that our sin is canceled. We're forgiven. All mankind. The sin debt is canceled. What remains, though, is that we have to trust in him and believe on him. And that is why it is incumbent upon every person to make that decision, to believe in Jesus, or you will not have eternal life. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, thank you for this opportunity to go step by step through the events of the cross, the events, the sayings, understanding their significance, uh, probing the depth of what transpired there, this, this transaction that is beyond our, our comprehension, that our sin, not in part, as the hymn says, not in part, but the whole, was paid for, canceled, paid in full. Nothing more need be done. Sin is no longer the issue. No matter how bad our sin has been, it is not the issue. It has been paid for. The issue now is, do we accept your free gift of salvation? Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins? And the moment you think, I believe that, it's true. When you agree that that is true for you, at that instant, God cleanses you from sin positionally, he imputes to you righteousness. You are declared justified, and you have been bought with a price. You are truly redeemed by faith alone in Christ alone. We pray that, Father, that anyone listening to this message would know that their salvation is not dependent upon anything that they do, but totally completely, sufficiently, by Christ's death on the cross. And for those of us who are already believers, that we must realize that what this means for us is that we are now yours. We have been sealed by the Spirit at the instant of faith. We have your brand on us. We have been bought with a price, and now we are to live for you. And Father, we pray that we might be responsive to that challenge. In Christ's name,